Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Today, we have a guest by the name of Megan Nugent. She's a project engineer at the Geotechnical Services for Collier's Engineering and Design. Megan will be sharing with us her insights in the world of geotechnical engineering. She'll also be discussing an intriguing project by the name of Riverton. Riverton is a site that has a central location. It has diverse soils. It has ground improvement processes, and they also have an innovative use for dredge material to use that as fill material on the site to raise the grades. So Megan will also be talking about the importance of mentorship, something that's very important to uh, the folks at EMI. And then she'll also be talking about how mentorship can contribute to success on engineering projects and also on the professional growth of an individual. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. But before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, that being Collier's Engineering and Design. Thank you to EMI sponsor Collier's Engineering and Design, a national full-service A&E firm. As an industry leader, CED believes it has a responsibility to ensure the built environment is constructed with a commitment to the inclusivity, health, and welfare of our people, clients, and communities. CED's expansion has fostered an enterprising culture that provides opportunities for employees to grow their careers while accelerating their personal and professional success. For more information about how you can join their team, find them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, or visit their website at colliersengineering.com. Megan, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're really glad that you could be on. Really been looking forward to this conversation. And it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about your background as a project engineer uh, for geotechnical services at Collier's Engineering and Design. And also what led you to pursue a career in geotechnical engineering? There's a lot of things you could have studied. Why geotech? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I joined Collier's Engineering and Design five years ago. We were actually major consulting then. And since we have joined the Collier's team, um, I work on some really cool projects here in my path to being a project engineer. Um, my time started off with a lot of field work, and I've really since transitioned into a little bit more of a project management role. I found geotechnical engineering the same way I kind of found civil engineering as a major in college um, by looking at the things I was good at and kind of eliminating the things I wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. But I really found geotechnical engineering just because I like problem solving and things like that. So it was just easier, like, Design is obviously very cool, and I enjoy that kind of thing, but I think the problem solving is the most important first steps of a lot of projects, and that kind of includes how are you going to build it and what are you going to build it on. So, and then obviously I love the field aspect of geotechnical engineering, you know, getting to be in the field, behind a drill rig, digging test pits, gets you out of the office every now and then. Oh, that's great. No, <laughs> no, no two days are the same, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, that's great. And I understand you're, you're currently in grad school, you're pursuing your MS in civil with a focus in geotech. So how's the experience been going to grad school part-time while working full-time? Like, how do you manage to balance the work and the academics and field work? Like, how are you doing all that? Yeah, I don't want to say I lucked out at the beginning because of the COVID pandemic, but I started in fall of 2020. So okay. I was able to knock out a few classes that way and, you know, not having to commute the 45 minutes to Rutgers where I'm going. But since then, I think it's just been kind of really keeping up with my managers and letting them know and putting everything on a schedule and blocking out my time so that I'm not disturbed. Um, not to say it doesn't get tricky sometimes, but I think as long as I'm communicating with my manager and letting her know, you know, I have a test coming up this week or there's a big final project. I mean, final season's always a little bit hectic, but I think we've figured out a schedule to manage it well. Oh, that's great. And how many classes are you taking at one time? And are you doing them at night? Or are you doing your classes during the day? Like, how is that working? Yeah, so I take most of my classes. Well, all of my classes are at night. Um, okay. I take one to two classes at a time. So this semester, last semester, I actually just took off to study for the PE exam. But uh, next semester, I'll have to take one class because I only have one class left. But I have taken up to two at a time. Okay. Wow. So you got the PE, you got the grad school, you got a lot going on. A lot going mm -hmm. on. <laughs> well, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit more about that. We're going to talk about the Riverton site now, switching gears a bit. And you tell us yes. a little about the central location of the Riverton project, proximity to major roadways, transportation hubs. Tell us a little bit more about that. Set the stage. Yeah, sure. So um, Riverton is kind of the biggest project that I work on, and I've been involved in it the five years since I've been here. 
Um, it's one of the largest brownfield redevelopment sites in New Jersey, and it's, I mean, 100% worth the cleanup process just because of its location. Um, it's located in Sayreville, New Jersey, so that's one of the most central towns really in New Jersey. Um, the project has its own exit off of the Garden State Parkway, and it has a very close proximity to Route 9 and Route 35, which are being altered and widened uh, to accommodate the project. There's also access to 440, which will get you to Staten Island in a few minutes, and it's also really close to the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, also location, 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 as the real estate people <laughs> say. Uh, Riverton also has several miles of like frontage on the Raritan River and the Raritan Bay. Um, and it's, you know, over a more than 400 acre site with proposed mixed use development of, you know, residential, retail, hotel. Um, but it's been a great project to get involved in as a young geotechnical engineer, um, really high profile and a lot of cool things to learn. Oh, that's great. Talk a little bit about the uh, the soils that are there. I understand there's variability to the soils and then uh, the ground improvement processes that have been imp implemented at the site. Sure. Yes, yeah, so like I said, it's more than 400 acres, the parcel that we're currently developing, uh, developing, but the geology of the project varies significantly. Um, some by natural processes and other just due to the past manufacturing facilities that were out there. Um, the northern and eastern portions of the site have soft river sediment that's covered with dredge spoils and manufactured process waste. The center of the site is mostly loose sands over clay formations, and then the southern portion of the site is stiff clays with numerous lagoons that were part of the past manufacturing facilities. Um, so the kind of the ground improvement processes that we've done out there is ISS, so this in situ soil stabilization, and that we did to stabilize all the lagoons that were out there. Um, we performed deep dynamic compaction on the loose sands that were in the central portion of the site, and we have ongoing and proposed surcharging for the soft and compressible soils. And then we're actually filling a bunch of the site with um, processed dredge material for structural and non-structural fill. Got it. And, and these items are items that you were responsible for designing, or these were designed prior? Uh, what's that? Um, yeah, so the main geotechnical engineer, I work for him. So, I mean, we're the general civil people on the project. And, you know, we also do some of the geotechnical engineering, the wastewater engineering and everything. So it's kind of, you know, a multidisciplinary project. Mm -hmm. So I came on as I started five years ago. But um, the head engineer, Jim Servica, who works on the job, he's been on the job for, I think he says like 11 years. It's been a really long time. So. Wow. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a big site. It's a lot going on there. And, yeah. and what role what role does the uh, in-situ soil cement blending play in stabilization material stabilizing the materials uh especially as it relates to the on-site dams and below building pads like how's that mm -hmm. all working out yeah so like i said the iss pretty much did in lagoon areas so it was like this um not great soils that were in lagoon state so we stabilized them by mixing them with portland cement um Usually it's up to 8% port or a minimum of 8% Portland cement. Um, and we're used to depth of mixing is determined by what the repurposes is. So we used it under the proposed Bath Pro Shops, which I think is one of the bigger um, catches to the area or what people in New Jersey at least know the site to be is the proposed Bath Pro. So we did full depth mixing, which was like eight to, 20, eight to 14 feet there with a high Portland cement ratio. And then under the dam, we mixed about 10 feet with a significantly lower amount of Portland cement since the future development loading was less than, you know, a big building that was going to be on there. Okay. And are you doing this with augers? You're doing this with an excavator's bucket? Are you doing this with paddle mixers? What is the the way you're, you're, you're creating these cells or, or volumes? Yeah, it's kind of, it's really a bit of trial and error process. Um, mm -hmm. They had done it before I even started when they did the Bass Pro mixing, and that was a different method. But the way that we did it to do the dam, which was something I, you know, was part of inspecting, was using buckets, excavator buckets. So we had the mm -hmm. buckets out there and we pumped the Portland cement into, well, I didn't do it, but, you know, <laughs> part of the Portland cement into these big boxes to keep it from, you know, escaping in the wind and things like that. So it was mm -hmm. pumping it in that way. And then, yeah, mixing with excavator buckets and, um, control testing from there. Okay. Got it. Got it. And then you said you also had deep dynamic compaction. So that was for the uh, sandier portions of the site. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we have some shallow sands that are out there that are above clays. So we use deep dynamic compaction in a limited area of the site, just um, because the soils, shallow soils were susceptible to liquefaction. Um, so that was, I mean, I don't want to say as primitive as it gets, but, you know, just dropping a big weight on there. So that was a <laughs> cool thing to see, which I hadn't seen before. But yes, yeah, so that was just those surface soils. Okay. Okay. And and how has, uh, so how has the surcharging 
been done. You're, you're surcharging to deal with the compressible soils that, and then or you have organic soil, soils at the site as well. So are there specific monitoring instruments or techniques that are being utilized to make sure that your surcharge is working and know when to remove it? Yes, absolutely. So we have two separate, like bigger than 25 acre surcharge programs that have been completed to date. And there are 70 acres of surcharge remaining. So to be surcharged or being surcharged right now. Um, yeah, so I mean, we use big drains obviously in the process to take out the water and get the consolidation that was required. But we also um, installed electronic data, instrumentation, data loggers, um, for settlement, pour water pressure, um, inclinometers, piezometers, really, you know, had it all, make sure we're getting what we need. Right. And how many people are, are out there at one time from like from the geotechnical standpoint? Is this one person watching all this? You have multiple people? It's, uh, uh, yeah, we kind of say we have one person out there who's who kind of <laughs> covers it all. But, you know, in busier seasons, we'll have two or three people out there. But yeah, we definitely have full-time inspection of those kind of things. I mean, there's general processes that are going around all the time, like, you know, smaller undercuts or utility installation. So those things, we have someone out there inspecting full-time. And then, you know, when it's the more individualized projects like the DDC or the ISS, we'll put another person out there, you know, with the knowledge just to make sure everything's getting seen and covered at the same time. Okay. Okay. And, and you also have dredge material that's being processed out there. So can you tell us a little bit more about the, the use of the processed dredge material as fill at Riverton and also how are you managing the moisture sensitivity of the material during placement? Yeah. So the site has come up several feet since I've even been there, which has been really cool to see in the last five years. So the biggest fill that we use is the processed dredge material. Um, so that's just, you know, river sediments or wherever it's excavated from, treated in the offsite facilities and trucked to the site. Um, and we've been using it as fill. It comes in, like I said, trucked in, spread, and then a big process of kind of dealing with the moisture sensitivity, like you said, has been um, tilling the soil. So it's almost like we're farming out there. The soil mm -hmm. gets placed, it gets tilled. So it's, you know, exposed to the sun and the air for a while. And then it's compacted after that and in place. So it's usually takes about two to three days between lifts, which if you think about on like smaller construction projects, that's a huge timeline to wait two to three days between lifts. But, you know, we have such a huge area that we're spreading it. So it's usually a two to three day kind of process. And then obviously we're new gauge testing it and, you know, making sure it meets the compactions. Okay. And then, um, are you, are there retaining walls around the site as well? Or, or are you doing this like natural slopes? Um, not yet. There aren't any retaining walls. Um, mm -hmm. We did actually build a velocity zone wall out near the river. Um, well, that's in the process of being built, but so far it's not as far into development to have big retaining walls or anything yet, but. Okay. Okay. And when you say the grade has, has raised a lot since you've been there, I mean, are we talking like, like roughly how much it's like, two to three feet, 15 to 20 foot. Yeah. So where you come in on the site, it's only been like two or three feet, but you can see mm -hmm. they place some of the um, manholes and everything already. Cause you can see where it has to come up and how far it has come up and just backfilling that. But farther mm -hmm. back on the site, I mean, I think it's an order of like seven to eight feet, but it could even be more. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. And, and how have you had, you know, how's, how have mentoring or mentorship relationships, formal and uh, informal, has that in influenced your growth as an engineer and has that helped you on this project yeah i would say i kind of wouldn't be where i am today without the great mentors that i have so i found that you know finding a few solid mentors is the quickest way that i've kind of grown in my career um we have a formal mentorship program here at ced which actually my mentor um this go around is richard mazer who started the company hmm. um which has been you know a really valuable learning experience and understanding business relations and company structure and things like that um, but I've also found like, you know, less form, um, more informal mentors, such as I have a bunch of women mentors who I look up to, and then there are people who I can go to for financial questions and project setup questions. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, Jim Serpico, who is the head geotechnical engineer on the project Riverton, he's really has a lot of detailed advanced geotechnical engineering knowledge. So that's where I've had the chance to work with him and learn a lot of concepts. And I mean, his kind of mentality is work hard, play hard. So <laughs> I've definitely adopted that as well. But um, just at Riverton, there's mentors all around in our civil department. And then even just the people who are out there developing the site, you, you know, really have the opportunity to learn a lot every day. Oh, that's great. That's great. And have you found that you've had opportunities to be a mentor to someone yet? 
Not yet, which is something that I'm really looking forward to. So through mm -hmm. our formal program, that's something I'd like to get a little more involved in. And then, um, sure, I feel like in the fields, I'm definitely have taught some newer people. So I think, you know, that could definitely be considered a mentorship opportunity. Awesome. Awesome. So within your expertise, uh, can you share any other interesting or challenging projects that you worked on? Sure. Um, we're working on a lot of projects. Obviously, right now, I think one of the biggest things that I work on day to day are our infiltration investigations. So dealing with the intricacies of the New Jersey BMP Chapter 12 can certainly be daunting. Um, mm -hmm. I mostly work for my internal civil department, though, on jobs like these. So they kind of you know, they're the ones dealing with the regulations changing and things like that. But we've kind of set up a good structure for, you know, figuring out how deep we have to dig and making sure we're testing in their right areas. But I think the biggest challenging, biggest challenging projects right now have been a lot of those infiltration projects. Okay. And like they say, there's none of the, no good sites are left in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of infiltration tests being performed in Jersey right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So looking ahead, what are the anticipated benefits or advantages, of the ground improvement efforts, and also the engineering strategies that are happening in Riverton? And this could be in terms of the project success and also long-term sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I said, the processes that we've put in, like the DDC and the ISS have definitely, the project wouldn't be possible without these things that we've already put in place, just because to even be able to move around the site, we needed a lot of these um ground improvement processes. And for the future, we have, you know, like I said, more surcharging, we have more DS DDC proposed and more ISSing actually. And then, um, you know, other foundation alternatives like rammed aggregate peers and load transfer platforms. So there's a lot of design still yet to come, um, you know, to keep the project sustainable. And like I said, it's been a huge cleanup effort. Um, so that's been a huge improvement and I think keep it sustainable for the future as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, when you reflect on your journey as an engineer, and again, you're, you're still pretty early in your journey here, <laughs> but what advice would you give to aspiring engineers or those considering a path in geotechnical engineering? Are there some key lessons or experiences that have shaped your perspective and your approach to work so far? I think the biggest lesson, which I was recently asked this question, is kind of never stop learning. Hmm. Um, like you said, I'm obviously young, um, still learning with graduate studies, and I'm at the beginning of my career. But I think the most successful people that I look up to, you know, still attend seminars, they do research, they learn from people in other disciplines. And I think advice that I would give is that, you know, no one knows all the answers. So try not to be too hard on yourself. This is no. advice I also need to give myself. But, um, <laughs> you know, more than you think you do. And I think specifically in geotechnical engineering is, you know, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. <laughs> there you go. That's great. That's a good note to pause on. And we're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out with Megan in our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. Welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Megan Nugent from Colliers. Now, Megan, you've had a very successful career. And again, I, like I say, you're, you're early in your career, but it's been successful so far. Uh, when you look back at your career, what's something that you've implemented in your career to give yourself a factor of safety in your career? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. I do my very best to make sure I have as many positive relationships as possible as my factor of safety. So I'm lucky to work with so many great people who truly feel like I have, I feel like they have my back. Therefore, if I need some last minute help, need to meet a deadline, need an outlet to vent about a frustrating situation, or just need a lesson on an engineering topic I don't feel too familiar with, I really feel like I have the people in my factor of safety corner, more or less. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming on. Thank you for all the great insight uh, that you shared with us and with the listeners and those that are viewing. Uh, you shared a lot of great information. I know it's going to be helpful for those that are with us right now. So if somebody's listening or watching and they said, wow, I'd really like to reach out to Megan, what's the best way for people to find you? Are you on social media or do you have an email address you want to share we can put in the show notes? Sure. Um, I have a LinkedIn, which is my first and last name, Megan Nugent. Um, and then my email also is megan.nugent at collierseng.com. Excellent. Excellent. We'll make sure we get that in the show notes. Thank you so much for being on. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Jared. 
I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 78, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, I wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.